My name is John Ross from the Art of Retouching Studio. In this video, we're going to be talking about how the bit depth of an image affects the tonal range of an image. This is important to understand because if you allow Photoshop to be in control, it will easily choose something for screen display and not necessarily for print display. Tonal range goes from absolute black to absolute white with shades of gray in between. Absolute black is referred to as 100% black. Inside of the shadow areas, it's referred to as 75% gray, or the three-quarter tones. Next, we have 50% gray, or the mid-tones, and then we have 25% gray, otherwise known as the quarter tones. And finally, 0%, which is absolute white. At its core, this information is good for simple grayscale images where you have black, white, and shades of gray in between. Each shade of tone is referred to as a step, because, as you will soon see, you are only allowed a certain amount of steps when going from black to white. Once you introduce the concept of color, you can now work in RGB, which is red, green, and blue. Each color gets its own channel. It kind of looks like the old film days. Here, we have the darker the shade, the higher concentration of that color. If you were to overlay each of the channels together, they combine to display a full color image. Your images are made up of pixels. Think of a pixel as a single data point that contains information about color and luminance. The accuracy of the information is determined by the bit depth of that data. Bit depth is the number of steps, or shades of gray, that it takes to go from absolute black to absolute white. Photoshop, by default, wants to work on your images as 8-bit. This is fine for websites and other digital media. This is also good because most devices use an 8-bit display. While you could easily get away with using 8-bit for your regular photography images, as you will see, you will actually be missing out on a lot of possible color data. This is because 8-bit is actually quite limiting. But in general, most people are working in 8-bit RGB. The bit depth allows for 256 discrete levels of information per pixel per channel. This means that you will have 256 steps of gray for the red channel, 256 steps of gray for the blue channel, and 256 steps of gray for the green channel. Once they all get combined together, that becomes 256 times 256 times 256, which equals 16.7 million colors. Now that sounds like a lot of colors, and in most cases, it works out just fine. However, there is much more information that can be had when working with your raw files. To utilize the extra information, professionals spend more money on a monitor and graphics cards where one of the perks gives them a 10-bit display. This is 1.07 billion colors. This sounds great, but your digital camera is likely to be capturing in 12-bit mode, which is even higher at 68.71 billion colors. Suddenly, working in only 8-bit with 16.7 million colors sounds kind of small. That's because it is, and we still have a lot more to go. If you were to look inside a Photoshop image mode, you can see that there are three options, 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit. Beauty and fashion retouchers will often use that 16-bit option because that supports 2.81 trillion colors. Conceptually, you need that because once you bring your 12-bit image into Photoshop at 16-bit, you are then allowed the freedom to grow once you start adding adjustment layers like levels and curves. The higher the bits, the more the steps, and the less potential there is for banding in the tones. We have the same gradation in both the top image and the bottom image. The difference here is that the top image is an 8-bit, and the lower image is 16-bit. Currently, they both look the same. I'm going to start with the 8-bit image. By using the levels adjustment, I'm going to change the black output levels to be 110, and the white output level to be 148. This simple move turned the gradient into an almost solid gray. What I just did was modify the absolute black tones and the absolute white tones, and Photoshop crushed that information into this narrow band for the tonal range. If I was to take that level that I just made and drop it onto the 16-bit image below, then visually it does the exact same thing. Now, here's where things start getting funky. If I create a new levels adjustment, and on the top area, I change black to 110 and the white to 148, you will see that the 16-bit image is back to where it was when we first started. A nice smooth gradient from absolute black to absolute white. If I take the levels adjustment layer that I just created and I drag that onto the 8-bit image, your mind should now be blown. 
because we now have a huge difference between the two, where this 8-bit image is completely banding, and it looks nothing like it did in the beginning. However, the 16-bit image looks the same as it did in the beginning. The 16-bit version has enough overhead that it can handle being torn apart and put back together again. That is the difference between 8-bit and 16-bit. Once again, if you only have 256 shades of gray per channel in 8-bit, it means that when you start dealing with 16-bit depth, you now have 65,000 shades of gray per channel when that computer has to choose from in order to rebuild the missing data. This was a very deliberate and very technical example. In the real world, images are going to look the same to us. To the computer, however, it has a wider range of possible colors to choose from. This means any possibility of banding, like you see here, can be avoided. Let's get into a real world example. With this image here, there are a lot of different things going on. You have blues, you have oranges, you have black. You have tones that are bright and dark, different things are happening, and it's all broken up. Using 8-bit, which utilizes 16.7 million colors, is more than enough to display this image and print this image. Moving on, things are going to get more complex. In order to see what I'm talking about, I need to zoom in about 800%. Here is a sunset in 8-bit. While generally it looks fine, now let's compare that same image to a 16-bit version. When comparing, you can actually see how the 8-bit image is a bit more blotchy and choppy. At 16-bit, it's much softer. Not because it's blurry, but because it has 64 times more colors to work with so it can give a smoother transition from one pixel to the next. If we introduce the 32-bit version, it's most obvious in the top orange areas. We can see that when looking at all three together, the higher the bit rate, the more colors it has to choose from. But 32-bit is tricky because in order to actually use this file, we need to drop the bit depth down, and then that distorts the colors and tones in unpredictable ways. Additionally, once you enable 32-bit, Photoshop actually breaks. With less than half of the features still working, most things are simply grayed out or inaccessible. In order to really start showing you what I mean, I've intentionally boosted the contrast of these next images. The 8-bit, once again, looks fine, but that's only until we compare it to the 16-bit version. Once again, when you get up close, you can see how crisp and crunchy those pixels are in 8-bit because they can't make the softer transitions. In this last example, you can see how 8-bit has really severe hard pixelization and distinct banding. Banding is when you clearly see the rings or the lines. It's the steps we were talking about earlier as it tries to go from one shade to the next. It isn't as noticeable in the 16-bit version because it can make those smoother transitions. If you're in the dark about as to whether or not you need to use 8-bit or 16-bit for your image, unless you have a severe sunset gradient, you are more than likely okay with 8-bit. If you feel as though you may have a problem, simply change 8-bit to 16-bit while you're still editing in Lightroom or Camera Raw before exporting the file. If you do that, you should expect a nice smooth gradient out of your image. But yeah, this is the reason why high-end photographers and retouchers use 16 bits per channel as a standard. It doesn't mean that every image actually needs it. Very few actually do. However, we no longer need to even worry about banding as a topic for us or for our clients. After Photoshop's image mode 16 bits per channel, this is followed by Photoshop's image mode 32 bits per channel. 32 bit, however, is a whole other beast. It is the exclusive domain when creating HDR images. No need to even think about this bit depth again inside of Photoshop. So always keep your images at 16 bit and you'll be glad that you did. However, here's the thing though. In working on this video, I had the hardest time coming up with any images that actually required 16-bit. As a professional, it's my job to say that you need to use 16-bit on every image. However, as a professional, I also know where the color increase, and more importantly, the size increase, is actually needed. The problem we are dealing with today is that the new cameras come with such high megapixels, generally between 40 and 100 that working on them in 16-bit isn't really worth the slowed down workflow in Photoshop. I have a beast of a machine, and yet using 16-bit with smart objects from a 50 megapixel camera really leaves me waiting around while it pushes all those colors. Don't mistake the difference of using 16-bit versus 8-bit will reveal an entirely new world of color. It really just adds greater depth of possibility to each pixel of data. The thing is, your monitor can't see it, and your printer can't print it. 
So other than the placebo effect, is there any true value in 16-bit depth? Sunset images have massive gradations of similar hues. Quite often, an 8-bit display will not be able to show every color variant within that gradation. Instead, it will replace the color with the nearest neighbor that it can display. This will lead to visual banding on your monitor. I went through my own catalog of 90,000 images, and then I went through a professional photographer's catalog of 500,000 images, and I was only able to come up with a small handful I would even consider 16-bit as mandatory. Pros will likely disagree with me, but I stand my ground. The reason is that while all images will benefit from 16-bit over 8-bit, obviously, the true test is in the presentation. Assuming most digital displays are 8-bit, the quality will automatically be downgraded anyway. Also considering print media needs to go through an 8-bit CMYK conversion, I further stand my ground. For the passionate, I get it. If you have two adjacent pixels of similar quality in 16-bit, we will certainly have two adjacent pixels that are completely different in 8-bit. We will obviously lose fidelity of color, tone, variation, and definition. But I sustain that normal people glancing at the image simply couldn't care less. Either you agree or disagree with my assessment of 8-bit versus 16-bit images, leave your comments below. And that leads us to our next major topic, resolution. Be sure to check out that video as well. The link is in the description below. If you found this video helpful, please go to www.theartofretouching.com where you can find more tips and tricks to make you a better photo retoucher.